Get Rich Education is brought to you by Mid South Home Buyers, cash flowing turnkey property in Memphis, Tennessee. Welcome to Get Rich Education with Keith Weinhold, giving you information and ideas on the investment that has turned more ordinary people into millionaires and billionaires than anything else, and can provide you with more wealth and happiness than you ever thought possible. Now, here's your host, investor, entrepreneur, business owner, and educator, Keith Weinhold. Welcome to Get Rich Education. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. It's the money that you didn't know you had on episode 46. Yes, I'm back for another week to help you build your wealth. Here's hoping that you've been living abundantly. We're talking about your real estate investing strategy and outlook today. And, you know, some people wonder how, even though I was not born anywhere near wealthy, you know, sometimes I get asked, well, then how at a young age did you get the money to get into so many different investments? Well, you're going to get an answer on that today. Earlier, I had some friends over to our yard to play some lawn croquet. That's a cool game to play that's overlooked, by the way. Set up the wickets, grab the mallets, and crack some croquet balls, okay? It's a nice, chill thing to do. The perimeter of Mrs. Weinhold and I's yard has this kind of pebble stone landscaping, so that way you cannot crack somebody's ball, like, way out of the yard. That helps keep friends friends in a way, really. (laughs) I informed one croquet playing friend that would understand the joke that he was playing croquet on a highly leveraged piece of real estate. (laughs) Yeah, that's right. I may never want to pay off the home that I live in or any loan eligible rental property for that matter. I likely desire to hold high mortgage balances in perpetuity. Even though I could pay off my home mortgage right now, I don't desire to have a paid off home today. And you know, I probably don't even desire to have a paid off home by the time I'm age 45, 65, 85, 105. Okay, now I left myself a little out in there saying probably in case mortgage interest rates go to 12 or 15% or more, out in the distant future like they did back in the 1980s, or if rates got significantly higher than prevailing inflation. But for the most part, I have zero desire to have a paid off home now or anytime in the future, and you'll see why today. Okay, you know about the investor, I guess, quote or or phrase, a risk-free return. Ah, the elusive risk-free return. Well, I don't know that any investment is truly risk-free. Even FDIC-insured money in a bank is badly exposed to inflation risk because the rate of inflation outpaces the paltry yield that the bank gives you so that your outcome every year is effectively just your diminished prosperity. So I don't know that there's such thing as a risk-free return, really. Well, if a risk-free return sounds desirable, however elusive, how's this sound? Instead of a risk-free return, what about return-free risk? Yeah, how would you like return-free risk? That's right, where you will accept putting more of your money than necessary at risk, yet there's zero return while it is exposed to that risk. Well, why would anyone do that? That sounds terrible. Return-free risk? Well, as you'll learn today, you might be doing that now and perhaps even with a substantial amount of your money. This program today is one where some pretty savvy, experienced real estate investors have listened to this content more than one dozen times, and they learned something from it after new listens that they didn't quite catch or connect with on prior listens, and it kind of changes their mindset. So besides just this being thought-provoking, this material has prompted people to act. This episode made listener Ricky in Jersey City, New Jersey, do a cash-out refinance of his home to use those formerly stagnant funds to invest in more income 
property. Monique in San Jose, California cites this episode as the motivation that made her sell her home. (laughs) Well, that's one way to get all the equity out. And then I'm not really sure if she's uh, invested the proceeds yet or or what she's done. After hearing this program today, listener Douglas in, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I don't remember right now what town in Indiana that was there, Douglas. He repositioned his real estate investing portfolio and told me that he sees himself retiring much sooner after hearing this program today. I think those that have heard this program I'm going to share with you today, their reaction to this has basically been, my gosh, everything I thought of before is right side up in this world is now just totally upside down. So, you know, I'm here on the other side of the microphone. I never really know what episode is going to resonate with people or have... um, I guess the most powerful impact on their lives, but I would say that it's either episode 33 of the Get Rich Education podcast or more likely this program today. This was originally released in the United States on November 21st, 2014 as Here's Why You Aren't Financially Free. And this is the one program I've done that has been the most popular and I've had requests to translate this into Spanish and Portuguese. I just re-listened to it uh, once again about an hour ago here, and here it is. It's The Money That You Didn't Know You Had, featuring me on Get Rich Education. But first, I want to ask you, what if you knew the contact where you could invest in America's number one most investor advantage metro market of the last decade? In an all-done-for-you turnkey way where you buy a cash-flowing single-family home that's been newly renovated, already tenanted, and has professional management already in place. That's turnkey. You can do exactly that with Mid-South Home Buyers in Memphis, Tennessee, a company that the Better Business Bureau has honored with an a rating. Well, what if your property falls vacant for over 90 days? If that happens, Mid-South starts paying the rent to you themselves on day 91, but they've never had a vacancy of more than 45 days there in Renter City, Memphis. That guarantee is outlined at their website at midsouthhomebuyers.com or call the friendly, energetic Liz Nallen over there at Mid-South at 901 217 Four six six three, just like I and scores of other GRE listeners have. Hi, this is Russell Gray, co-host of the Real Estate Guys Radio Show, and you're listening to Get Rich Education with Keith Weinhold. Don't quit your daydream. I have a question for you today. If you were offered an investment that could never go up in value, but might go down, how much of it would you want? Yes, if you were offered an investment that could never go up in value, but might go down, how much of it would you want? Well, zero, right? (laughs) We're growth-minded investors, cognizant of opportunity cost, and risk-aware. The opportunity of what we could do with money, rather than have it invested in something that cannot go up in value and only go down. Well, depending upon your level of exposure to financial ideas and information, parts of what I'm going to tell you today could frankly be quite shocking. It's the kind of thought-provoking information that can potentially collapse time frames and shift paradigms for you. I'm going to have a conversation with you about home equity management and how its mismanagement is frankly, stifling your wealth. Now, even if you have zero equity in your home or you don't own your home, if you're interested in investing, you can learn as much from this today as a homeowner with a lot of equity could. In most cases, when I say home here, you can just as well substitute the term rental property. In the context of acquiring wealth, losers typically strive to be debt free, while winners strive to be financially free. Would you rather be debt free or would you rather be financially free if you had to pick one or the other? 
I mean, debt free simply means that you don't owe anyone anything. Financially free means that your income is great enough such that you don't have to work for money anymore. Well, no one achieves financial freedom just merely by eliminating their debt. In fact, you're going to see that many people have misdirected aspirations of being debt free. That focus on being debt free actually prevents them from ever becoming financially free. All right, so whatever wealth middle class Americans in much of the world have is mainly in their home equity. The greatest source of debt for most Americans is the balance on their home loan, what they still owe. Home equity is the difference between what you own and what you owe. Home equity is the name of the investment that I brought up at the beginning of the show that can never go up in value, but it can only go down. Yeah, that's home equity. All right, say, for example, you've got a home worth $300,000, 300K, and you still owe 100K on the loan. Well, the difference between those two numbers is your equity, $200,000. So if you sold the home, you would have about $200,000 left over when the bank loan was paid off. Your home equity can sort of be thought of as your skin in the game, okay? In that example, your skin in the game is $200,000, and the bank's skin in the game is $100,000 because you still owe them $100,000. Many in the traditional consumer credit world consider home mortgage debt to be something that you should get rid of, and their advocates focus on how great it would be to pay off that remaining $100,000 loan balance. Some scarcity minded people focus on settling to be debt free rather than trying to thrive by being financially free. You'll see that the actions one takes toward being debt free often prevent them from being financially free. All right, here are a few facts about home equity, and if this is new to you, it will shake up your mindset. You know, just in preparation for this, some people have believed the same old antiquated thing for so long that they figure that it must be true because the person isn't financially educated and they're learning from people that are not financially educated generationally. All right, so here we go. Home equity is not safe, it's not liquid, and its rate of return is zero. Again, how much would you want to invest in a vehicle that's not safe, that's illiquid, and and typically has a rate of return of zero? All right, so let's break these things down. First of all, why is home equity unsafe? I mean, why would it be unsafe, right? It's stored in your home. Isn't it just sort of like money in the bank? Continuing to follow this example with a $300,000 home, All right, say the $300,000 home appreciates in value 10%, just for ease of numbers, to $330,000. All right, let me ask you, did the presence or the absence of equity in the home contribute to that appreciation? No, it didn't at all. It didn't matter how much equity you had stored in the home. Real estate values change regardless of the amount of equity, skin in the game, that one has in the home. Putting more equity into the home or taking equity out of the home doesn't contribute to its market appreciation. Real estate home equity has a rate of return of zero. Appreciation has nothing to do with how much equity you have stored inside the walls of your home. Appreciation or depreciation of real estate is based on external factors outside the walls of your home. Things like Population growth, in migration, out migration, job creation in your local area, all sorts of supply and demand factors like the remaining availability of developable land in your community, all kinds of things. All right, so let's look at the flip side. What if the local community there that your home's in loses jobs, people move out, real estate demand falls, or we have another foreclosure crisis like we did in 2008, and that $300,000 property plummets in value from $300,000 down to $200,000. Well, your equity is the first thing to go. 
$100,000 of your equity, your skin in the game is slashed off, gone. Your equity was exposed to the market and you might begin to understand why it's unsafe. All right, when it comes to capital appreciation, let's compare stocks to real estate for a moment, all right? When you make a stock investment, your rate of return is the amount of growth per year divided by the total amount that you have invested in that stock. That's your ROI, return on investment. When you have a real estate investment, your capital rate of return is the amount of growth per year, again, and this time it's divided by the amount that you have invested. And in real estate, the amount you have invested at any given time is your equity. That's your ROE, your return on equity. So in the example where the $300,000 home rather increased in value to $330,000, it had $30,000 of property appreciation. All right, now follow along here. $30,000 of property appreciation divided by the $200,000 of equity in the home that results in an ROE, return on equity, of 15%. 30,000 divided by 200,000. Well, instead, if you had pulled $100,000 worth of equity out of your home to invest in another property, now you have just $100,000 of equity in the home. You would still have $30,000 of property appreciation, but this time it's divided by having only $100,000 of equity in the home. Yeah, that's $30,000 of appreciation divided by your $100,000 of skin in the game on that property. Well, that's a 30% ROE on that property. Plus, you would have another $100,000 of equity that you had separated from your home into potentially a second property. So see, by pulling $100,000 cash out of your home and putting it into, just say, a rental apartment building, you now control two properties rather than one. That's called an equity transfer. And you still have $200,000 of equity. It's just $100,000 in each of two properties now. It's still your $200,000 of equity, though you might have a corner chipped off of it for closing costs, okay? You basically didn't lose anything. It's just spread among two properties now. When you take a cash out refinance from a property, rather that cash is tax free and you can use it for anything. Now realize in this case that you did potentially make for a higher monthly mortgage payment on your home when you performed a cash out refinance, but in that case, as long as the difference between the new home mortgage payment amount and the old payment amount is exceeded by the positive cash flow that you receive from the new rental apartment building, you are dollars ahead on a monthly basis. Well, additionally, you now have two properties to potentially appreciate in value rather than one. So if you merely had the $300,000 home before, now you might have a $300,000 home plus a $500,000 apartment building. Well, if real estate appreciates 5% per year, would you rather have a 5% gain on $300,000 or a 5% gain on $800,000 every year? After the equity transfer, you have the same amount of equity you had before you moved some of the equity from your home into the apartment building. It's still your equity, yet you're leveraging a substantially higher total dollar amount. All right, so what is more expansionary? What is expanding your means more? It's performing the equity transfer and conscientiously going out and deciding that you are going to control more. But a little cautionary thing, be careful, you cannot absolutely count on appreciation. That's speculative. But on a national basis, over the long term, appreciation does happen over time. Be in tune with what's happening in the local market, though, that you have chosen to invest in. Now, remember, leverage cuts both ways. It magnifies your returns when the real estate market appreciates, and it magnifies your losses when the real estate market loses value. Market selection is key. We're going to get into that another day. Realize at the same time that even if your rental apartment building temporarily did fall in value, it is still an asset to you if the tenant rent income exceeds the monthly building expenses. When it comes to price appreciation, the market is typically more important than the property. 
you may not necessarily want to use all of your home's equity that you were able to extract and plow it into another investment real estate vehicle. In a down market, if your residence falls in value, you don't want to be so far underwater that you can't move if you have to sell your home and move. In that case, some dollars in a liquid side fund can help hedge against that. Home equity is not liquid. That means it isn't easily convertible to cash. I think that most people almost inherently understand this. To access equity, you pretty much either need to sell a property or do one of those aforementioned cash out refinances. Either one often requires a physical appraisal and a property sale also typically includes marketing time and costs, a property inspection, sales commission costs that you bear if you sell it, make ready expenses, and and all kinds of costs. Some people have even made extra principal payments to their home mortgage every month thinking that it's a good investment. Yes, people are doing that, or, or they think that it provides some rate of return to them. At times, banks pitch homeowner lenders to do these bi-monthly mortgage payment schedules that you get, you basically make the equivalent of 13 annual payments to the bank rather than 12. All right, well, think about this. When you send a bank an extra $100 monthly principal payment, think about what you're doing. You're basically saying, hey, Mr. Banker, here's an extra $100 principal payment. Don't pay me any interest on it. Oh, and if I need it back, I'll pay you fees, borrow it back on your terms, and prove to you that I qualify again. Money you give the bank is money you'll never see again unless you sell or qualify to refinance. You can buy property insurance to insure against catastrophic loss, but there's no such thing as equity insurance to insure against market losses. So why try to accumulate so much in any one property? Homes are built to house families. Homes are not built to store cash. All right, home equity also has a rate of return of zero. Savvy investors already know this. Home equity on the Wikipedia page even had it written that the rate of return on home equity is technically zero, right near the top of the page. At the last check, it wasn't on the front page and you could still find it in the page's history. I go through life almost all the time and find that generally the less educated a real estate investor is, the more likely they are to say, oh, I can't wait until I have this property paid off. Or someone tells me that they have a property completely paid off. I would kind of like to ask them, well, what are you going to do with that money in there? You know, and sometimes I get an answer of, ah, oh, it just makes me feel good. It gives me peace of mind to have it completely paid off. Well, do you realize how much that feeling is costing you? Really, it's sort of like when someone tells me that they have a boatload of money stored at the bank in a savings account that earns an interest rate of one-tenth of one percent. With either of those scenarios, I'd kind of like to know what they plan to do with the money. You know, I kind of want to ask that question. I'm a little bit incredulous that they would leave those funds where they are. Gosh, I guess at least money in the bank is liquid in that case so that it could be accessed more easily, rather. You can't even say that about home equity. All right, then there's the case of the 15-year fixed amortizing mortgage loan versus the 30-year fixed amortizing mortgage, which is my favorite product, by the way, the 30-year, just your plain vanilla loan. With a 15-year loan, I mean, you might pay, say, $800 more per month than you would with a 30-year loan. Just say that, for example. Well, I've had people point out to me that a 15-year is smarter because they save money on interest over the life of the loan. They can point out to me that they pay less interest over the term of a 15-year loan than they do with a 30. Well, once I talk to them, they don't usually say that anymore. Um... (laughs) On the one hand, they're right. They are paying $800 extra per month in order to do the 15-year. Instead, if they would have invested that $800 extra elsewhere, they would typically make more there than they would in mere interest savings by going with a shorter-term loan. I mean, sheesh, you know, additionally, good luck with making an investment property produce positive cash flow. If you have the higher expense of a bigger 15-year mortgage payment, 
you know, you're going to have a harder time, what I say, making money follow you. You know, consider too that people live lives. Things happen. With a higher 15-year mortgage payment, one might fall ill or lose their job or sometimes even worse things happen to people. You know, no one is guaranteed tomorrow. And with a 15-year loan, you've got a higher mortgage payment that you've still got to make. You must make it even in those adverse circumstances. If you have trouble making your mortgage payment for any reason, who do you think that the bank will foreclose upon first? Those with a little equity in their property or those with a lot of equity in their property? Well, the answer, it's those with more equity in their property are going to be foreclosed upon first. More equity is more risk in this case, too. All right, well, you might wonder, why would that be? Okay, just imagine this for a moment. You're the bank, and you have 10 homes within your portfolio that you need to foreclose upon because the borrower can't make their payments. If a borrower has hardly any equity, meaning less skin in the game, and still owes the bank a lot of money, meaning that the bank still has a lot of skin in the game in that property, then the banker won't try to foreclose on that borrower first. The bank would lose all of the amount that they still have owed to them from the borrower. There's still a substantial amount of bank skin in the game. All right, well, what's the flip side of that? Conversely, if a borrower has a larger equity position in the home, meaning the borrower has more skin in the game and owes the bank less, meaning the bank has less skin in the game, then the banker is more likely to foreclose upon the borrower with the larger equity position. Why? Again, it's because now the bank gets the home where the borrower didn't owe them much more anyway. The bank will snap it up. I mean, by the way, before you vilify banks for being ruthless with this tactic, think about it yourself. What if you were given 10 equal work projects to do and one paid more than the others? I mean, which of those tasks are you going to complete first, okay? So banks aren't ruthless in this sense. It's just unfortunate that they're more likely to foreclose upon the least educated homeowner first. Now, what about this scenario? Imagine there's a loss on your home, which you're insured for, a hurricane, tornado, volcano flood, or an earthquake severely damages your home. It's a tragedy. Well, it's a sad thing to say, and it doesn't commonly happen, but in the event of a big disaster where an insurance company could be at risk of making a massive payout to a ton of homeowners, an insurance company often has an incentive to come up with reasons not to pay the insurance claim or delay paying the claim, probably at a time while you're all displaced and in a motel and eating their underwhelming continental breakfasts. We saw this happen in one or more national disasters recently. I forget whether it was Hurricane Katrina or Rita or Sandy. But anyway, if your family's home is rendered uninhabitable in the event of a natural disaster and there's a dispute on what exactly damaged your home, you know, was it the hurricane's wind or the storm surge or the wind that led to the storm surge or the hurricane's rain that led to the flood and what can you make a claim for then? I mean, do you want to be in a scenario where you have to hire a lawyer to fight the insurance company? Especially at a time when your family, the people you love most, are vulnerable and uprooted, displaced from their home? Well, if you have a lot of skin in the game, equity, you're going to be the one most likely to have to hire legal counsel against the insurance company. If you don't have much skin in the game and you've left the bank with the greater equity position, the bank is going to have the incentive to want to hire the attorney. See, with every mortgage pay down that you make, you have increased the bank's security in this property risk, and you've decreased your own security and peace of mind. Again, more equity is more risk. See, you thought it was the opposite. Previously, you thought paying down a mortgage increased your feeling of security. All right, or what about this unfortunate scenario? We live in a litigious society. Some people are looking to sue. A neighbor's kid falls off your backyard swing sets, monkey bars, or a tenant at a rental property slips and falls down the stairs. 
I mean, what happens to a would-be plaintiff that did want to sue you until their lawyer found out that the case isn't even worth pursuing anymore because there's no equity in the property as lower-hanging fruit or reward that the plaintiff had hoped for? They likely won't even bring the case against you because it isn't worth it to them. There's hardly any equity there. You probably aren't surprised to hear that I keep minimum equity in my home and my rental properties not only to increase my leverage, safety, liquidity, and rate of return, but because it also works as an effective asset protection strategy. Now, especially when you can place rental properties in LLCs, then a suing plaintiff might only be able to pursue the amount of equity within that particular property's LLC. You know, one is hedged when they plan that way. If home and property equity weren't enough of a loser, A big equity position can make you more of a target. Make the bank share in the risk with you. Consider that. You know, again, really, it's about making other people's money work for you rather than only having your money work for you. Think about your control of a property, too. You know, whether you have a 5% equity position in a property or a 100% equity position in a property, You still have the same right to paint your home or make an addition onto a home or add a carport to a rental property to increase its income. Your equity position doesn't affect your control at all. More property equity also decreases your tax deductions because mortgage interest is tax deductible typically, though that reason in itself isn't usually enough to uh, keep a high mortgage balance, but there's often enough other reasons to do so as you're seeing here. Okay, so no one achieves financial freedom just by eliminating their debt. Are you paying the opportunity cost of having more in home equity than what's prudent? I mean, how does that opportunity cost manifest itself in your life? What are you missing out on? You didn't have some of your home equity safely separated or earning a return elsewhere. So you could never send your daughter to piano lessons because you couldn't afford it or you thought you couldn't afford it. You thought that money was better utilized, stored as substantial home equity. Your family and you yourself never had a Hawaiian vacation because you thought that additional home equity contributed to your security rather than took away from it and left you vulnerable. You know, again, homes are meant to house people, not store cash. In fact, you're going to see that many people have misdirected aspirations of being debt-free. That focus on being debt-free actually prevents them from ever being financially free sometimes. Some people say something to me, they're like, you know, hey, I don't care. I want to get rid of that monthly payment. They say once that payment is gone, you know, then I can live better. Well, first of all, how many years of missed investment opportunity cost? How many years of diminished lifestyle for you or your children are you going to weather to try to pay off something that likely isn't providing you with much help? Look, when it comes to this getting rid of the payment, you know, I guess I can best explain it. I'll give you an example of this and I'll just go ahead and open it up and personalize it because I know this case study well because it's my own situation. All right. So, We're talking about me in this example. I think it's the way I can best give you perspective. My wife and I's home, our primary residence where we live, is a $500,000 home. I owe $425 on the loan. There's $75K of equity there. That's 15% equity. I have a monthly payment of $2,600 on our home's what they call PITI, Principal Interest Taxes and Insurance, the mortgage and escrow payment every month. If I wanted to pay off the $425,000 loan, I could do it pretty fast. I could sell enough of my rental properties to retire that mortgage loan and be debt-free on this home. So effectively, right now, I have this home paid off on paper on my personal real estate portfolio's balance sheet. But once I pay off the home, in reality, retire that loan and really do it, the opportunity cost of doing that is just too great. Here's what I mean. The apartment buildings that I would have to sell to pay off the $425,000 loan have a passive positive cash flow of greater than the $2,600 a month mortgage payment. So it's more like $4,000 of passive monthly cash flow on those apartment buildings that I would lose. 
So to pay off my loan and retire my $2,600 payment on my home, I'd lose $4,000 of monthly income. Well, I'd be $1,400 worth off every month. I mean, actually, it gets even worse than that because additionally, I would lose the loan paydowns that the tenants on those apartment buildings are making for me. I'd lose the tax benefits too. And a really big thing that I'd lose is the value of the real estate portfolio. I would shrink. Like I said in the last episode, no one shrinks their way to wealth. If real estate appreciates at 5% per year, again, that's historically, nationally, on average, I want to own more real estate with those same dollars of equity, not less. You know, that's not even it either. It would get even worse if I paid off our home. I still wouldn't even retire the $2,600 monthly payment. I just lose the $2,000 mortgage portion, the principal and interest part. I'd still owe $600 a month for property taxes, property insurance, and who knows how much for maintenance and upkeep and utilities. So paying off my home, even though I have the ability to do so, that would be one of the most reckless and uninformed financial decisions that I could possibly make. You see, when one pays off their home, that money isn't working for them anymore. They've retired a large portion of their money when they go pay off their home. Because a person just went and sent their money to retire, now their money and other people's money, the banks, is no longer working for them. So now the homeowner needs to spend more time working and they can't retire as soon. You cannot retire because you sent your money away to retire. The fact that you've sent your money away to retire and made your money stop working, that means that you're going to have to spend more of your life working to compensate for that potentially ill-informed decision in your postponing retirement. Now that's some severe opportunity cost for not being financially educated. So I keep my equity positions low for safety, liquidity, rate of return, and asset protection. In fact, just last month, I had one of the more prominent local real estate agents come over and visit our home specifically to see if he thought that it had enough value and that the value had increased enough such that I could separate more equity from our home. I don't want it to accumulate. Again, I'd be doing that for reasons of safety, liquidity, rate of return, and asset protection. Now, some might say that they wouldn't want to take equity out of their home because they have such a low mortgage interest rate and they would have to refinance and they would lose that low mortgage interest rate. Well, actually, often that's not true either. You can keep your first loan in place, not touch it, not reset its amortization schedule, and keep that rock bottom interest rate in place. What you would do in that case is take a second mortgage on the property, keeping that first loan in place. That second loan often takes the form of a HELOC. H-E-L-O-C is the acronym Home Equity Line of Credit. And that's available at pretty low interest rates today, too, though it's often not as low as the first loan that you keep in place. Right now, you usually need to keep at least 15% equity in your home, meaning that you can borrow out up to 85% of the value of your home. That's the lending climate that we're in today. Your mortgage loan officer would refer to that as an 85% LTV ratio or loan to value ratio. But you know, what you can do there depends on you and your credit score and and other factors. So you've got to see your lender. So for example, with a $100,000 home, you could have up to $85,000 total borrowed against it. That means if you currently had a $50,000 mortgage balance, you could borrow another 35K. The $85,000 total loan amount minus the 50K that you already owe. That's a possibility. Now, I don't want to steer anyone with what to do. I'm not saying you must do this or that I necessarily recommend that you take any of these actions today. Get Rich Education shares ideas and information and provides actionable content to give you more food for thought, give you the ability to weigh the pros and cons yourself. All right, so listen to the disclaimer at the end of each show and see your professional. I'm more into telling you how to think than telling you what to do. All right, so here's a thought. Here's an example that I share with students to help give you a visual example. Visual examples don't quite work through an audio medium like this, but I I think this one's easy enough to picture. All right, I go ahead and put a glass on a table, and this drinking glass represents a home. All right, this home 
increases in value. So I'm just going to go ahead and slowly raise this empty glass up off the table. This home increases in value at roughly 5% a year, and it's empty. There's no equity in it. I put the glass back down on the table, and then I pour this green colored water. I put uh, green food coloring in water as an example for students, and I fill that glass to the brim, 100% equity. The home's completely paid off. You've put all your money into it. And now, very carefully, since the glass is nearly full, I raise the glass up off the table. It's slowly increasing in value, going up toward the ceiling at 5% a year. That's going to happen regardless of whether you have equity, money, represented as that green water in the glass, or if that glass is completely empty. All right, then I go take that glass away, and I bring back a platter with five glasses on it, And those five glasses are now each one-fifth full of this green colored water, representing 20% equity in each one of the five homes or glasses. Then with that platter sitting on the table with the five glasses, one-fifth full of this green colored water, I go ahead and raise that platter straight up toward the ceiling as well just to show whether you have one glass with 100% equity in it full of green water or you have that 100% equity fractured off into 20% in each of five glasses, now you've got five properties appreciating in value at 5% rather than just one. All right, now note with five properties rather than one, you can be invested in different geographic markets with each one of those glasses or properties, reducing your risk while you've expanded your portfolio. So I hope I've given you some perspective today about the significant risks associated with storing substantial amounts of equity within one's home or one's rental property. You know, in a way, doesn't it floor you? Isn't it ironic or paradoxical that home equity is the number one source of wealth for Americans today? Yet so many manage it poorly because they don't understand it. They focus on building equity by paying down the mortgage balance, placing Benjamin Franklin's in the walls. Come on, I mean, dude, dropping Benji's behind the drywall and between the wood studs? And what are you doing creeping around back there? What kind of investing is that? So what's this all mean for you as you consider potentially looking for a down payment for a rental income property or some other investment? Well, maybe, just maybe, now you've discovered a source of capital that you hadn't considered employing before. Maybe now you don't desire to put as much of a down payment on a property as you had previously. (laughs) Maybe you know someone with equity in a property that might be your dad. (laughs) And if they hear this show, they would access that equity for you. Some lenders allow you to show a gift or a loan amount for a down payment. Robert Kiyosaki famously said, your home is not an asset. He's referring to your primary residence. It's a liability because it takes money out of your pocket every month and an asset puts money in your pocket every month. I would agree with that to a great extent. The get rich education addition to Mr. Kiyosaki's statement is that your home is less of a liability to you and your family when the equity is intelligently managed. Typically, being financially free has far more power and impact in your life and the lives of those you love than merely being debt-free would. Rather than focusing on being debt-free, thrive in effort to be financially free. Hey, thank you for investing your time with me today. Now, armed with this new knowledge, you're going to be more likely than ever to go out and don't quit your daydream. You've been listening to Get Rich Education, telling you what the wealthy won't tell you about real estate and investing. If you enjoyed the show, please take a minute to visit iTunes and leave your comments. Nothing on this show should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own. Information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have the potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of Get Rich Education, LLC, exclusively.